I'm delighted to be here with all of you today. Um, I, I love these classes without quizzes. I, I think it's such a fun opportunity to meet people like you who are interested in coming back and learning about these topics. Um, I have to say, as I talked to a couple of you as we were coming in, this is a particularly important time uh, to be doing this work, I think. Um, I have been, as you heard, I've been passionate about the environment and education for a long time, for, for most of my life. My parents are, are classroom teachers. Um, I remember growing up and spending a lot of time outdoors, not actually, interestingly, not because my parents are outdoorsy, actually, um, but it's just, it's been something that's been important to me for a long time, and yet, and, and as you perhaps can tell, I actually am an optimistic person by nature. Um, but I have to say, you know, these, these last few months, it's, it's been a hard time to be somebody working in the environmental and conservation field. Um, and it's, there, there are times, especially the past few weeks, when, it, when it's hard to kind of get up in the morning and keep going and recognizing that you're really up against a lot of challenges. And yet I also think this is exactly the time that doing work, especially around education and communication in this sector, is particularly critical. Um, so I am really grateful to be at a place like Stanford that has privileging, that privileges uh, interdisciplinary collaboration around this, where we have students who are so passionate about this work, um, and we have really great partners. And so that's why today I will be talking to you about the work that my research group does, um, that our students are really involved in, and a lot of the work that I'll be talking about, I, I at times will probably say I, but actually I mean we. Um, and anything that I talk about today is really any work that we've undertaken in collaboration with community partners, in collaboration with the large research team, um, in collaboration with people like Paul and many others, both in the Bay Area and beyond. Um, and I and I hope that it will have an impact on some of the issues that we're that we're all facing. So um, that's that's kind of the context for this. So I wanted to talk about environmental education in national parks kind of generally, um, although that is a pretty ambitious title. Um, and that's partially because when we frame it like, like that for, for this type of program, I think you know, they, want a, they want a really general title that will appeal to a lot of people. Um, but again, I will specifically talk about some of the research projects that we're doing. Um, I also will say that I grappled a little bit with what picture to put up here. And I'll, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in just a minute. Um, and I, before I frame it anymore, I'd actually like to go to my, to my next slide um, and ask you to reflect on maybe what, what brought you to this talk today rather than all the other fabulous talks that are going on. I looked at the list of them and I thought, gosh, I'd like to go to that and that and that and that. A number of my colleagues are speaking and I recognize a number of the names um, and titles that were, that were on there. Uh, yet there was something that motivated you to come here today. Uh, and I'm interested to know about that. And so I, I'd like for you just to, for a moment, take 30, 45 seconds and think for a minute about what is a meaningful experience that you've had in, in a national park. Um, think about what is it that made that park important for you. When you envision that experience, you can take a moment and either close your eyes or just sit silently for that, with that for a minute and think about what, was, what did that experience look like, what did it smell like, what did it taste like or feel like, um, who was with you, what did you do during that experience, what do you remember about it, what makes it memorable for you. Um, and then after that experience, did you take that experience away with you? Did you bring it back home with you in some way? Um, did you return to that place again? Did you return to those people? So just take about just take about 30 or 45 seconds to reflect on that. I, I mentioned I was I was struggling a little bit with what picture to put up at first. Um, as a researcher, I'm always thinking about how am I priming people, right? I recognize that whatever image I put up, the first slide would prime you to think about national parks in a certain way. Um, and that, you know, we, when, the way I framed this would make you think about certainly a, po a positive experience and not that having, not that having fear is necessarily a, ne a negative thing, but I think when we think about kind of connecting with the outdoors or nature, we, you know, we kind of always automatically, especially in this context, go to something positive. But certainly my graduate advisor, Steve Peller, talked about these values of nature and one of them is kind of having that, that kind of fear or that kind of, you can have that kind of awesome sense of fear, which of course is another way of connecting with nature. Uh, and so I think it is really important to recognize that we have this really holistic sense of values that we bring to our connection with the natural world. So I'm really glad you brought that up as well. Great. 
Well, it's, so, it's interesting to hear this kind of diversity of experiences that people have. I'm glad, actually, that this group over here, too, kind of started out by talking about the urban environment in which we live and the ways in which these connections with these national park experiences at times may or may not connect back with the place where we live or how you can, how you can work to actively really try to construct your national park experiences and, and bring them back. Um, and, I, and I wanted to think about, you know, how is it that we imagine national parks? And so again, going back to that first slide, you know, when I, when I put that first one up again, I, I several times over thought about, like, should I add several different pictures there? Should I only have one type of park? Because when we think about national parks, you know, we automatically, I think, go to what we think of as like the crown jewel parks. Paul mentioned that I, I worked at Grand Canyon Park as a, as a park ranger. And um, we think about Yosemite and Yellowstone and, and these ones that are really the iconic parks. But really, there are also these, in the national park system, there are many parks that are actually in urban areas. And when we think about the most visited parks, Golden Gate is one of the most visited parks in the park system. Um, and there are many parts of that that are urban. We also think about, I'm, I'm from the Washington DC area, and the National Capitol Mall is, is a hugely visited part of the national park system. And then certainly we do of course have parks that are, that are the Yosemites and the Yellowstones and the Grand Canyons, and then we have many that are in between. So the national park system is, is a hugely diverse system. It's a system that, that affects people and it reaches people in many different parts of the country in many different ways. And so by, by setting people up to kind of think about what are the different ways that we can have education in national parks, uh, I really like to suggest that we're not only talking about one kind of education. We're not only talking about also, we're not only talking about kids. You know, several of you gave really great examples of being adults and going and having kind of powerful experiences. Uh, as Paul mentioned at the beginning too, I work in the School of Education here and we have, a, we have an incredible School of Education here at Stanford. Many of us in the School of Education focus on, focus on youth, but many of us are also really interested in this idea of what does it mean to, to have lifelong learning as part of that learning continuum. And so some of the examples that I give today will be focusing on youth in these park settings, but I'd like to encourage you as well to think about what does it mean for, for those of us who are, who are beyond our, our youth years. Um, not only for nurturing the youth in these parks, but also for our own lifelong learning experiences. The other part of today's talk um, is to think about what is the role of environmental education. And so to, to break that down a little bit, I, I wanted to, to just describe what it is that we think of when we talk about environmental education. So here at Stanford, I'm fortunate to teach several classes in environmental education. And Paul mentioned that he's been involved in kind of his, his sunset or his second career. I, I would say it's not, it's, you've got a whole full career beyond your, your first initial career focused on the area of environmental education. And there's a lot of unpacking that goes in, into that term. And when we think of environmental education, I, I think a lot of people, again, think of, of kids in a very specific setting. And yet it's really a quite diverse field and it's becoming, becoming more diverse over the years. I wanted to, without spending a lot of your time on this, um, I wanted to talk a bit about the history of environmental education though and how that informs where we are with the field today. And in particular, in light of some of the issues that we're, that we're facing as a world and how we think about environmental education now, um, the way that the history has really informed that and how it really helps us then get to this kind of problem orientation that we see today. So if we think about some of the issues that we're grappling with, things like, things like climate change, things like toxic chemicals, um, things like uh, endangered species or protected areas that are really these large scale issues. In the past, we started with a field like nature study, which was around in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and we still see a lot of that reflected in environmental education today. And yet environmental education today isn't only about the nature study component. So nature study was really focused on this idea of, um, of people knowing and understanding the natural world around them. Interestingly, and there's a, there's a huge history to this, and I'd be, I'd be happy to talk with anybody about it afterward or during the question and answer period, but there was, there was this interesting, um, during the Industrial Revolution period, there was this kind of interesting panic that was happening among a lot of parents and a lot of families that their, that their young people were losing touch with the natural world around them. And so you'll still see there are a lot of books that were published during this time that are actually still in print today. And this was happening, this came out of Cornell in particular. There were a lot of uh, parents who would send their kids out to the country during the summer. 
to feel, to help them reconnect with the natural world. And so of course there still is a, a strong threat of this in environmental education. Uh, and yet what ended up happening um, was during the, during the depression uh, and then during the, um, during the Dust Bowl, the recognition that just understanding the natural world around you in terms of knowing what the species were and knowing where the species lived was not, was not enough. It didn't have enough of a, of a problem-solving orientation. At that time, we saw this shift into what we thought of as conservation education. And so conservation education came around in about the, the 1930s, 1940s, and it, it actually transformed into a lot of what we see today in terms of the government agencies that focus on environmental education. So a lot of you who think of environmental education in terms of government programs might see it in terms of uh, the, the Soil Conservation Service or um, programs even, it's, interestingly, there's been a lot of talk recently with, with the Boy Scouts, um, the Boy Scouts and Eagle Scout type programs. Um, if we think about things like 4-H and programs like that that might have an element of environmental education to them, a lot of those kinds of programs, you know, uh, uh, Future Farmers of America, FFA, they were starting to come around and talk about more about environment and conservation at this time, when it was kind of thinking about what's, what's the problem and then what's the solution. And that's really this kind of problem-solution framing that we saw with, with conservation education. The definition that we, we often use today in environmental education came out of a charter that was in the, the late 1970s. And there was a lot that was happening in the environmental sector in, in the 1970s. Um, and I know we said that this is a class without a quiz, but here's your opportunity for a quiz. <laughs> so those of you who were around and paying attention to the environment in the late 1970s, um, mid-1970s, what were some of the things that were happening at this time that, that may have prompted um, interest in education around the environment at this time? Ab absolutely. Clean Water Act was, was happening around that time. Yeah. Both of these, the, the Cuyahoga River burning, which helped motivate people's interest in Earth Day, Clean Water Act, Santa Barbara oil spill, absolutely, overpopulation. Um, there was another a big book that came out around this time, too, that people still talk about today. Rachel Carson, exactly. So, so this sense, and actually, and what you know, what Rachel Carson's book did was really get people to start thinking about in terms of systems. So it was this idea that it that something happening in one place could really affect what's happening elsewhere. Um, so that, in addition to all these other issues, started to motivate things like legislation. So legislation like the Clean Water Act, things like the Endangered Species Act. So there's this idea that there was going to be legislation that was going to be able to address some of these environmental issues. The other interesting thing that was happening at about the same time was that there was a lot of unrest going on politically in the country. So there was, for, for around that same time though, there was this sense that the government wasn't going to be able to solve everything. And so that's when we start to see this shift to these kinds of definitions of environmental education that's trying to really motivate people from the ground up to get engaged in issues. So if you look at this, this definition, which I, I will not have you read all these words on here. This is, uh, we like to talk, talk about these, as we call these MIGO slides, my eyes glaze over. Um, but the, the words that I have bolded up here that are important and that are different from how we thought of conservation education or nature education is this idea that we're not only focusing on helping people gain information or helping people just understand elements of the natural world, but rather helping people also gain skills and be able to get engaged in decision making and helping people feel like they actually have some kind of power to make a change. So it's kind of taking that civic engagement element and then really applying it in a systems thinking frame. So when we think about environmental education today, this is really what we're, what we're imagining. And so it's this idea that thinking about that as a lifelong learning pattern and getting people engaged in a systems thinking frame in a, in a lifelong learning context. And so this gets us back to this idea of national parks as an incredible context for place-based learning, systems thinking, being able to really think about what it, what it means to have people interacting with the community around them, both the natural and the human-built world. If you go back to those examples we were giving earlier, the fact that national parks are located not only in these kind of more rural, remote areas, but also in urban areas, 
National parks give us an incredible context to be able to think about this. And the fact that they are federal lands also provides a really interesting context for a lot of these conversations. So I want to pause here for a moment and, and mention just something about what it is that, that our research group here is really interested in studying. Uh, Paul mentioned it at the beginning that I'm in the School of Education. I'm also half, so I'm half School of Education. I'm also half in the Woods Institute for the Environment. And the Woods Institute for the Environment is a, is a really interesting institute here on campus that has faculty from all of the schools on campus. And our commitment within that institute is to focus on a solutions orientation. And so we are very interested in thinking about what are the most pressing environmental challenges facing us today, and what is the, what is the tool set, what are the skills that we can bring to address those challenges. So my research group is really interested in this idea of thinking about what is the role that environmental learning can play in addressing engaging people in environmental behavior. So how can we think about environmental behavior not as just a one-off action that someone can take, but how, rather how can we have people think about that as part of their everyday life? So this, this is a very simple schematic that we, that we use as kind of a motivation for thinking about when we take on new projects. Do these new projects kind of fit within this scheme? Um, we try to think about where do they fit within this context. We're really interested in this idea of everyday life settings. So how does environment affect us and how do we learn about environment in the course of our everyday life settings? Uh, we're also really interested in this idea of these extraordinary settings. And of course, the notion of extraordinary, what's an extraordinary setting to me may be different than what's an extraordinary setting for you. Um, but, but this idea of a national park or taking kids to a national park for a week is, is pretty extraordinary. So when we talk today about these kind of programs like you mentioned Yosemite Institute, today I'll call that Nature Bridge, um, or you think about going to the aquarium for a day and taking somebody out of school for that, or um, going on a nature-based tour to a place like Galapagos, which is another place where I have the opportunity to work, which is really, you know, I feel that's such a gift um, to be able to go places like that. These are all kinds of things that take people out of their ordinary life and really have people take a, take a kind of a second look at what's, what's happening in the course of my everyday life. On the other hand, your everyday life settings is where you're making a decision every day, day after day, about how are, you, how are you commuting, how are you getting food, how are you interacting with your neighbors, how are you teaching your children about what you believe about the environment and the world around you. So both of these are contexts where we think it's really important to knit together this idea about how we learn about the environment and then how we make decisions about our behaviors. All of the work that we do in our group is connected with partners on the ground. And to me, this is an essential element of the, of the work that we do in terms of research, as well as the work that I do in my courses and the work that both my graduate students do, as well as the undergraduates in our lab group. Um, and I, I would think that as alums, this would be a piece that would be of great interest to you as, a, as an instructor, as a as a faculty member, as a teacher, this is really important to me. And as a researcher, this is really important to me. Um, also, as someone who worked in the field, I, I worked at World Wildlife Fund before I went back for my PhD. Um, as Paul mentioned, I, I worked in Wisconsin at a children's museum for a number of years. Um, I worked as a park interpreter. Because of all of those experiences, it makes it really important to me that my students have an opportunity to do grounded work in the world. So rather than just being in a class and talking about it, it's really critical that they actually get out in the, in the field and see what this looks like. So these are just a couple of examples of places where we actually do this work, connecting learning and, and behavior in, in everyday life as well as in these extraordinary settings. And today, I'll just, I'll just choose one of these partners and walk you through, um, at a very high level, a couple of the studies that we have done with them. So I mentioned we have someone here in the audience who's been to um, Yosemite Institute. And Yosemite Institute today goes by the name of Nature Bridge, um, partially because it started in 1971, I believe, as Yosemite Institute in Yosemite. They then expanded to a number of national parks. They now have uh, programs in six national park settings. And so it, it went from being Yosemite Institute to being Yosemite National Institutes, which was confusing, and they rebranded. They're now called Nature Bridge. And Nature Bridge has been a really important uh, research partner and teaching partner for, for our team for, gosh, probably about eight years now. 
Um, and this has been a great partnership. It's been a great learning partnership for me. It's been a great learning partnership for my students. And I feel so fortunate that they are willing to open their doors. And it, you know, it takes a lot of confidence as an organization to have researchers kind of come along on, on your shoulder and walk on the trail with you and be in the field. Um, although I should say that all those other partners that I just had listed on the slide there are equally generous with their time and equally generous with opening their doors to us. So Monterey Bay Aquarium, the Girl Scouts of Northern California, um, other national park sites. Uh, so we've been really fortunate to have these great partnerships. But today I'd like, to, I'd like to hone in on some of the work that we've been doing with Nature Bridge. With, the, with Nature Bridge, they see between 30 and 40,000 kids a year in their, in their six national park settings. And they do, as we heard earlier, they do residential, which means overnight um, trips with their kids. I'd like to talk about some of the work we've been doing with them to try to figure out what exactly happens in these settings, because this is where these transformational experiences have the opportunity to occur. A lot of the research that we see in this sector, so in the environmental education sector, as well as people who are interested in understanding what it is about these kinds of settings that can be so powerful, the way we often do that research is to look at these settings before and after someone goes. So as you can imagine, you might do a survey or you might do interviews with people before they go to a place like Yosemite or before they go to a place like the Grand Canyon or um, before, they, before they spend you know, a couple of hours um, at one of these really interesting national park settings even in an, in an urban site. And then you might do a survey with them afterward. And you might ask them about things like, um, their science content or their, um, their interest in nature or their understanding of the national park system. And then you might do uh, some kind of post survey or you might do some kind of um, post interview afterward. And one of the real challenges with that is that it leads to what we call this kind of black box approach. Um, which, so you've got these kids who kind of come in on the bus and they're really excited or they're, you know, kind of doing whatever they do on the bus. Again, I mentioned I have, a, I have a daughter who's in fifth grade and I can tell you there's a lot of excitement on the bus that may or may not have to do with learning at that park setting. Um, you've got this black box of this experience that occurs and then you've got some kind of intended outcome that you're going to measure at the end. And the challenge with that as both a researcher as well as people who are working on the ground trying to do these great programs is that it's really hard to know what is it about that program that's actually creating that important experience. So if I go back, and I, I was taking a couple notes as you all were going around at the beginning, and, and you talk about the things that were powerful for you. So you talked about kind of your senses and the, you know, the things that you, were, that you were smelling and feeling and touching while you were in those sites. You talk about the interpersonal interactions you had there. Um, you talk about the things that were scary for you or that were different for you. We don't know any of those things if this is just a black box. We don't know in that black box what's happening unless we actually are there on the ground and we can see it happening. So the work that we've been trying to do in these settings is to try to measure what happens during the process and to try to open up that black box. And the question, the overarching question we've been trying to ask is what makes these experiences transformational? We've been hearing for years, for decades, that a lot of these experiences are transformational. You know, as we've heard, there are a number of school systems that have been sending kids to these types of experiences, not only Nature Bridge, there are a number of other programs. And I've actually had the great fortune of working with some in Great Smoky Mountains at Tremont, um, in some in the, in the Tetons. There are school districts that commit resources and time, and teaching time and, and instructional time because they believe these are powerful and transformational. So the question is, what is it about these experiences that makes them transformational? And how can we leverage that? How can we leverage that for these kids? How can we leverage that for other people elsewhere? We have been talking about these as these kind of slippery concepts. Uh, I don't know if any of you grapple a little bit with that question I asked you at the beginning, to think about that experience try to reflect on it and think about what made it important for you, what made it transformational for you, what made it meaningful, even if I didn't use the word transformational, what made it meaningful for you, that's sometimes a hard thing to reflect on. It's hard to think back, like, wh why was that powerful? Why I remember it, but I can't tell you why. So we call these these slippery concepts. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm going to, in, you know, in the interest of time, we've just got about, um, we've just got about 10 more minutes that, that I'd like to kind of talk at you, and I will also actually say um, 
that when I have classes here, it is rare that we, that we interact in this way in classes. In classes, it's usually actually small group interactions and outside. Um, but I, I just like to, I'd like to give you just a glimpse of a couple of these studies. Um, and again, I'm happy to talk uh, more depth um, in questions or afterward about some of the other work we've done around this. But I'd like to give you a sense of like, how is it that we're trying to open up this black box and figure out what is it about these experiences that's so powerful? One thing we started with doing uh, by spending a lot of time on the trail and in the field with, with these young people is we did a study around blogging with them. And that may initially seem um, very antithetical to what you would imagine in a, in a national park setting. The, the way we got to this, though, actually goes back to this first um, pair we had over here that gave us this example of saying, you know, we had this really interesting experience, and then we went home and we thought about, like, how does this experience connect with what we, what we experience at home? One of the biggest challenges that we have in these type of residential experiences or these national park settings that feel very different from kids' home environments is that those environments are so completely separate that when you go back home, they feel like, well, that was, that was Yosemite, and now I'm back in Sacramento. What happens in Yosemite stays in Yosemite, right? <laughs> what, uh, and actually, in fact, one of the most, most interesting articles that we read in my environmental ed class, that the students talk about the entire quarter, um, is, is titled, Nothing to Care About Around Here. And it's an, it's an article based on kids who were in New York City and then went out to the Catskills and had a really interesting residential experience and the findings from that study were that the kids, once they went home, felt like, well, there's nothing to care about around here, because what you care about is out there. So this blogging study was motivated by that. This blogging study was motivated by this idea, like, how can we get these kids to process their experience while they're in their field, share it back with their parents while they're in the field, and then when they go home, they've actually got this really powerful documentation of what they did while they were in the field. The other thing I will say about this, too, is I don't know how many of you have, have children um, or have been kids at some point in your life. There's more of those. Um, and your kids come home from school just during the day, and you ask them what they did today, and the answer is mm, nothing. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> um, this is a way to get around that as well. So this is a way to kind of have that dialogue going constantly, but also in a structured way. So we gave the kids cameras. We worked through in a very structured way so that the kids would have kind of a framework for them to share back with their parents. This tells you a little bit about the structure of the study. Again, I won't get into the details too much here because I, I just wanted to point out a couple of um, interesting elements that came from this. But over the course of the week, we had more than 250 blog entries from these kids um, and more than 2,000 photos. Um, we had our researchers in the field with them and dialoguing with them as the kids were spending time in the field. We also did a pre-trip activity at school to kind of get the kids set up to think a little bit about what are some of the things they might want to document. And then each day we had a pair of kids work as reporters so that they would kind of interview each other and they would think a little bit about what were some of the things they'd like to be sharing back with others at school as well as with their parents. Some of the findings that we found interesting and that have then provoked additional studies that we've been continuing over the past year and a half or so, we to think about what were the elements of the day and of the week that were most salient for the kids. And we have since then compared that to what NatureBridge has in their core education framework and what is it that NatureBridge thinks is most salient in terms of their education and their learning goals. So the kids are talking about things like social interactions, perhaps not, not surprising, and something that is a really important element to capitalize on with these young people. They're also talking about aspects of connecting to personal growth. So what is it that's, that's really challenging them about the experience? They're talking about what are, what are elements of connecting to the place? What are elements of developing their own sense of personal identity in, these, in the field settings? I am going to skip through these great quotes for right now, which I know it's, it's killing you, but I am happy to share this with you afterward. And I will tell you, too, that we have an article on this, so you can read the article. Um, and I will skip to the, to the last reflection on this, because I would like to, um, with my last few minutes here, share the, the other study that this sparked. Um, 
And I will say that reflecting on what kids found powerful in the field and shared back with their parents and with their teachers, we really found that the kids were emphasizing, in addition to, of course, how beautiful these places were and how much they were learning about science and content, the kids were really focusing on these interpersonal interactions and how much they felt like they were growing as individuals. Those of you who have been with kids in the field in this kind of setting know, especially at this age of your fourth and fifth grade, this is a time of really intense personal development. And for these kids, and again, you know, at the time, my daughter was a lot younger, but now that I see her at this age too, you can really see that this is a time of, of, of really kind of grappling with a lot of changes and being away from home. And for these kids to spend this time away from their parents in this really interesting and very different setting, that was what really stuck for them. And, and for them, that was part of what really made this very transformational in terms of this place-based learning in this national park setting, which is, which is a very interesting element. And I, I love this quote from John Jarvis here, where he, he's the, he's the uh, former director of the Park Service, and he talks about that a single positive visit in these park settings can really create a lifelong pattern for people feeling like parks are a good place to go then and later feel like it's a place for personal growth and personal reflection. What was interesting to us from this study is it got us thinking about what is it about that Nature Bridge experience that fosters reflection. So going back to the, the black box diagram, we then thought, okay, if, if these kids are really honing in on the importance of these interpersonal interactions, what is it about that experience that nurtures these interpersonal interactions? Because as you've seen, I hope, from the photographs that I've, I've chosen, I've showed you, a lot of what they're doing is actually more focused around kind of doing some science explorations. A lot of it's focused around you know, being in these gorgeous places and hiking and really focused on kind of more of the science and environmental content. And yet what the kids are getting, again, is the social element. So I'd like to close my last few minutes with talking about, um, I have to, yeah, I feel like I can't say something is my favorite study because it's like choosing your favorite child, right? It, it feels wrong, but, but I will say that this has been for me one of the more powerful studies that we've done over the years. And we've, we've, done, we've done quite a few studies with Nature Bridge. Um, but one of, my, one of my, I think one of the more, more interesting studies that we've done with them and one that's left some interesting open questions that we're continuing to pursue and that was motivated by a couple of our earlier studies was that we, we then found that one of the key elements that kept coming up over and over was this idea of trust and this idea of that these group settings really build trust among the kids in a very different way than occurs back in their home environment. So what we heard from the kids was this idea that trust in these small groups while undertaking these field challenges is very different than what occurs in a classroom setting. It's very different than what occurs in their home community. It's very different than what occurs even when they're, when they're playing in a, on a playground with their friends back at home. One of the other interesting things that happened for us is that when we decided we wanted to explore trust in this Nature Bridge setting, in this, in this national park um, kind of challenge related setting, was that we had a really difficult time finding instruments that would allow us to do this. Most of the trust studies that have been done with kids this age uh, had been done in laboratory settings. And the questions that were asked in that setting were very different than the kinds of questions that we would be asking in this kind of setting. So the questions that we ended up asking are those that you'll see here. We were really interested in these peer-to-peer -peer trust settings. We wanted to know how do these peer-to-peer -peer relationships change over the course of a week? We also were interested in how do these peer-to-educator relationships change over the course of a week? And if you think about it, you know, a week intensive seems like a lot of time. On the other hand, we are looking at schools of kids, some of whom have been together for their lifetime. You know, many of these kids are coming with schools where they, these are, we, this particular study, we have sixth graders. So some of these kids have been together since kindergarten. So it's interesting and, and it feels like it's a, it's a bit um, audacious to think that we are going to get change in these trust networks over the course of three to five days when these kids have been together for that long. Um, but yet, you know, again, we were getting this out of some of these earlier studies. 
So the way we did this was we went into the classroom initially and we talked with kids about what their perceptions of what, it, what does it mean to trust somebody. How do you define trust? Uh, and we did some pre-post surveys with them about who do you, who do you trust um, in terms of your peers? Who do you, who do you think trusts you? Um, we worked with them to help develop the instruments, which was really interesting and fun for us, I have to say, because the instruments we had, as I mentioned, were, didn't feel satisfying for us initially. We had two different schools in this study. We had one where the kids knew each other well beforehand, and we had another where they, where they didn't, where the trust networks initially were, were looser. And then we adapted these measures so that they felt that they were more uh, appropriate for the Nature Bridge setting. And with the questions we ended up asking, we did end up focusing more on elements like reciprocal trust. So if, you know, I, I trust you and you trust me. Um, we had elements of if you had a problem, who would you go to with those kinds of questions? Um, and we also then had questions around this idea if you could ask, if you could ask somebody to make a promise to you, because that seemed to be an element that was really important at this particular age. And then we built out of this this idea of a network. So we were trying to look at what was the network of trust. We found that in particular, among the school where the kids didn't know each other, where the, where the network was really loose, that just in three to five days, which is a really short time, that that network increased substantially and significantly over time. And I have, actually, I have a lot of, I have a lot of thoughts about this um, that I would love to answer questions about during question time or talk to you more about afterward. Um, but in particular, we, we've thought a lot about this since then, about the importance. You, some of you mentioned that you've, you've done these kinds of programs with students. The importance of the timing of the year when you do this. Uh, the idea that you can build these trust networks so quickly. Uh, if you think about, you, do you do this in the fall? Do you do this in the spring? Is this the kind of program that is really important, perhaps, to do in, in the fall? to build these kinds of relationships early on so that, so that kids feel like they, they have someone on their side or they've got someone maybe from a different, a different network in school or someone outside of their normal peer group. Um, it seemed really powerful to us. Um, it also really built the sense of safety and security among the kids in a very different and, and interesting way. I will say too that some of the quotes that we had from the kids were, were really powerful and moving. Um, the sense that the kids had safe space with each other, uh, especially in a world where, going back to this idea, we, we did a lot of reading around kind of digital relationships, but the fact that these were in-person relationships where kids physically felt safe with each other, they were doing really challenging um, physical activities in terms of going on difficult hikes, um, going on having difficult, going on night hikes where they were really being pushed to do new things um, with, again, with people with whom they had not interacted previously. It was, it was really interesting to, to read some of these quotes. Um, I will, I'll let you look at some of these on your own here. These are some of the other ones that I, I found very powerful, and some of the quotes are, are really um, moving. Um, one of the other interesting ones was this idea of kind of keeping secrets or keeping confidence, and this idea that if kids felt like somebody, they could trust someone. Um, one of the examples that kids gave is, you know, often when you're on a day-long hike, there are not restrooms nearby, and is there someone, is there, who can be my lookout, right? So who do I choose to be my lookout? And that might not be your buddy at school who's going to be your lookout. Um, the kids also talked about that there were, there were often kind of these groups that would form around kind of who's going to be your cheerleader. Uh, and again, those, aren't, those weren't necessarily the same networks that we saw that were, the kids were reporting back at their home. And this idea of reciproc reciprocal trust and safety was also another really important one. I find these very interesting as well, um, and I've reflected on these a lot with my team, because they are more about physical safety, which of course you wouldn't necessarily have in a classroom setting. So you know, that's another dimension to this is it's, that's interesting, that I think it creates a, a different sense. Um, there's, almost, I mean, there's almost a higher, um, there's kind of a higher penalty for not having trust, but also, but also more, of a, um, 
more cohesion that, that forms through this, and it does kind of create that in a, in a faster way. Um, I will end by just sharing some of our reflections on this, which is that we were really interested to think about what does having a stronger trusting community mean, not only for a social group, but because our group is interested, if you'll recall that diagram we had earlier, we're really interested in this kind of these environmental outcomes. So we are asking what are the, in, what are the environmental implications of this? Nature Bridge as an organization is interested in environmental literacy in the end. They're interested in getting people to this notion of environmental skills, attitudes, knowledge, behavior. So what does it mean to have a trusting community and how does that relate to environmental behavior in the end? So I will tell you that when we um, published our article around this, we had a lot of dialogue with our reviewers around what does it mean to have a trusting community and how does that relate to environmental behavior? We've been reflecting on this a lot, and it's actually led us to our next vein of work that we're now pursuing with Nature Bridge. And Nature Bridge is pursuing a lot of work around ideas of social emotion, social emotional learning, and looking at connections between social emotional learning (SEL) and environmental education or environmental literacy. So, what does it mean to have a community that is that is highly skilled or highly competent in social emotional learning? and is able to make good decisions about the environment around them. And so this is actually where, where I'd like to leave you today with just kind of just to, just to put that question in your mind, to kind of think about a community that's able to be trusting with each other, a community that's able to grapple with challenging issues that are changing over time, a community that's able to be able to come together cooperatively and be able to know kind of who's going to come into the community and really be able to discuss issues like you know, safety, security, uh, you know, climate, toxic chemicals, um, decisions around protected areas, um, things that are, that, are, that are constantly shifting. These are not, there's not a, a yes or no answer. There's not a right or a wrong. So as we think about these complex issues, the way that these kind of relational um, skills come into that space are really important. So this is where we've been moving now in our, in our discussions with Nature Bridge and our work with Nature Bridge is to try to think about what is that relationship and what are the skills that kids are gaining in these, in these settings and how does that relate to some of these environmental literacy outcomes. So I'm going to end there and, and say that I've just, again, used Nature Bridge as one example. We are working in other national park settings. We're, we're working, um, looking at climate change in national park settings. Um, with That's primarily with adults, but we're also looking at kind of how are park interpreters interpreting about climate change. We're working in um, some international settings, looking at how these transformational experiences get people engaged, both during the experience itself as well as once they go home. But all of those, I think, have a similar vein in them, which again is kind of connecting these, these extraordinary experiences back to people's everyday lives and trying to think about what is that, what is that golden thread that continues. Um, so thank you so much for your, for your time and your focus, and uh, thank you for your interest in this area. I really appreciate it.